Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello and welcome to the course Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. This is a Nano Hub U course, and uh, my name is Tim Fisher. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at Purdue. This is the first time I've offered a course like this, and so uh, I look forward to it very much. Um, we're going to go through a series of lectures every week. We're going to have six lectures every week, and they'll be about 20 minutes, give or take a few minutes each. And uh, we'll plow through, and we'll get a, to week five. That'll be the end. Um, and then we will we'll have homeworks. Um, we'll have a couple of exams. We'll have example problems. Uh, and all of the other online um, features that, that NanoHub U is offering. So I look forward to it. I'm going to start with the general big picture problem that we are going to be trying to solve. And it starts really with a problem involving heat flow from one hot reservoir to a cold reservoir with something in between. And that something that's in between is uh, these days often people try to put very small scale objects and try to understand how heat flows and maybe the heat flows better or worse depending on uh, the type of object that sits between them. Uh, a lot of times that's called uh, some form of nanotechnology. Uh, but if that device begins to grow then we can also have um, you know, certainly continuum scale heat transfer and the old laws of heat transfer they still apply. In fact they, they apply much more often than I think people give them credit for. And we're going to try to pull all of these things together into a framework that is accessible to people who have a background kind of with a general engineering or science background um, and try to do it in a, in a somewhat less complicated way than you might have seen it done before. We're actually going to start with uh, an equation like the one at the bottom. This will be a model equation for us. Q is the rate of heat flow and it's comprised of a number of multiplicative terms that sit inside of an integral. Omega here is, is frequency, which is a surrogate for energy. Um, and it, the, these terms, we will break them down one by one throughout the course. The first term is the number of modes, which is a, a little bit um, of an abstraction of a couple of different concepts and we'll go through that a little bit later in the course. Um, H bar omega is the energy of the carrier. That's always important if, we, if we're thinking about energy transport. The, the cursive T is the transmission function and that's something that's generally quite complicated but we'll try to, to pull out some of the key features and to highlight those. And then F minus F here, these are the carrier distribution functions. Uh, at two different temperatures. A lot of times the electrical engineers will have seen um, have seen those as a function of the Fermi energy or the chemical potential. And then we integrate that entire thing over frequency or energy and we get a heat flow rate, Q. I'm going to go through these terms in a little bit more detail. The term M is comprised of two main entities. One of them is VG, that's the group velocity. It's going to be very important. We're going to study that a lot, especially early in our lectures. The other one is the density of states, so that's D of omega. And that's something that we'll get to kind of in the middle of the course. These are two very important factors, and to know either of them, we really need to know something about how the energy of the different states that are allowed for the various carriers of interest, those would be generally lattice vibrations and electrons, how those energies are distributed um, in terms of wavelength, for example. The second main term on this chart is h bar omega. That's, uh, that's simply energy. I think you've seen a lot of that. This term, capital T, is the transmission function. And that, as I said on the last slide, is pretty complicated. But it's not so complicated that we can't understand its main features. And we'll do that generally in the last week of the course. So this will be week five, the transmission function. Before we get to most of that stuff, we're going to have to do something with statistics. And these are the distribution functions of the carriers. So statistics will comprise a good portion of the beginning 
of our lectures, um, really essentially chapter two, uh, after we get through some of, uh, some of the details of lattices and bonding and vibrations in lattices, that'll be, that'll be what we'll do the rest of this week. So I look forward to it, and uh, we're going to start now with the, the study of lattices. To understand lattices, we really need to understand first atomic bonding. So how do atoms come together, and what does a bond mean? And for our purposes, what makes a strong bond? And what can we understand about lattice vibrations once we do understand the bonding? So if we just take two atoms sitting side by side, they will be separated by, let's say, R0. That's an equilibrium separation. Of course, if they're vibrating, it will be... Uh, more or less than that, but the equilibrium or the average position will be R0. Now this bond is not, again, rigid. It's a spring, it's, or it's spring-like. Uh, we're going to idealize it as a spring. But before we get there, if we looked at the potential energy, that's capital U, as a function of the separation between the two atoms, you'd see a curve that looks kind of like this blue curve. It's, I, we've kind of drawn hand-drawn that in here but it's not a very, very simple function. However, it, there are some, some functional forms that, that people can use uh, that, and have used uh, to good effect. Um, if we pulled the atoms apart so that they essentially didn't see each other anymore, then we would call that the state where the um, potential energy is zero. And then the energy, the potential energy at the equilibrium separation when they're bonded uh, that energy will be less than zero, and the difference between that energy and the zero energy is the bond energy, because if the, as, as R goes to infinity, then the bond has become broken. Now, we're not going to study too many of the nuances of, these, uh, of this curve that, that is a somewhat unusual shape. We're going to idealize things for the most part, and in particular, we're interested in lattice vibrations that generally don't have a very large displacement. And so most of the movement is happening down at the bottom of that potential energy well. And so because of that, we can make an approximation that's usually good. There are some limitations to it, to this approximation that we'll go through um, as the course proceeds. But generally speaking, if we call lowercase u the difference between the actual separation R and this equilibrium separation R sub zero, then we could make a spring type of equation where the potential energy is proportional to that separation away from equilibrium squared. So that's the potential energy is proportional to U squared and the, co the constant of proportionality is, a, is G, which is a spring constant, divided by two. And so this hopefully looks a little bit familiar uh, to, to folks who are studying this. If not, that's all right. Um, we will find soon that that, uh, that that spring constant will be expressed in terms of force, and it may be, um, it may be a little bit more familiar in, in that context. So let's go back to bonding quickly. Um, generally speaking, we need to understand bonding for two reasons. One is the strength of the bond. Uh, and the second thing is that we also have a high interest in the electronic contribution to thermal energy transport. So we need to understand the energy states that electrons can have uh, when they have bonded together, when, when atoms have bonded together to form generally a solid. So as here we're showing two isolated atoms. They really don't see each other. And these horizontal lines show the allowed electronic energy states. And we'll do a little bit of derivation of that, but not, not too much. Um, that's a little bit more back into the, the fundamental physics than we'll go. Uh, but we will understand the consequences of those, of those uh, energy states. So these electronic states are quantized. There, uh, there are four quantum numbers. The first one is the principal quantum number that relates to energy. And then we have magnetic, angular momentum, and spin. I think most people have heard, heard of all of the, these if they've taken a, a basic course in, in physics. So if we, so we have these four quantum numbers and if we look at them on uh, in, in the way that they're usually expressed, they're usually expressed in terms of a, a combination of numbers and letters. So 
when the uh, principal quantum number n is uh, that's given the, the first number of any of any of these states but then the orbital quantum number which is related to angular momentum that's given a letter s or p or d right? and then you go on and on down the list um, and you could have a number of different states if we had just a hydrogen atom hydrogen has one electron and so it's, its equilibrium state is down here in the 1a s 1s state uh, but that electron can be excited, and so it could go up to the 2s or the 2p, and so on. Uh, but this is mainly here, I'm, I'm including it just so that you can appreciate some of the things you probably learned in physics and chemistry from before. When two atoms come together to form a solid, or in some cases a, li a liquid, uh, and in some cases gases as well, of course, if we have diatomic or more than two atoms per molecule, um, what happens is this, the electronic states cannot be occupied at the same time by two different electrons, at least of the same spin. And so we, we have to make some accommodation for other energy states. And this is called electronic hybridization. What happens is when two atoms come together, their energy levels split a little bit to allow for the sharing of electrons. And when this bonding happens, there are different types of strengths, different, uh, there's a different natures of the electronic bond. And we won't go through all the details of these, but I think it's important to note the general energetic character of the different types of bonds. So Van der Waals bonds are something that people hear about quite a bit. This is a weak bond due to a dipole moment. So that's sort of a shifting, um, a sh a shifting uh, polarization of, uh, of an atom or a, a molecule. And that energy level is very, very low, uh, about 10 milli electron volts or 0 0.01 electron volts. If we compare that to the thermal energy, and we're going to use this term thermal energy quite a bit, uh, the thermal energy is, is Boltzmann's constant times temperature. So if that temperature is room temperature, then the thermal energy is 0 0.03 electron volts or 30 milli electron volts, which is more than a Van der Waals bond typically, at least in terms of an order of magnitude. And so Van der Waals bonds at room temperature can break and form quite easily because the thermal energy is enough to perturb them. Hydrogen bonds uh, are due to electronegativity in atoms, uh, so the water molecule is the most common of these. And that's a, a somewhat stronger bond, but still 0.1 electron volts. That means that it's not too difficult to uh, to break the bond. And most solids have uh, something called covalent bonds where, these, where their atoms share their valence electron states. So silicon and diamond are examples of these. And here, those covalent bond energies are in the range of one to 10 electron volts, which is orders of magnitude higher than the thermal energy. That's why solids tend to stay together at room temperature. At least the ones that do stay together have these, these strong covalent bonds. Ionic bonds are similar, except in an ionic bond, one atom completely gives up its electron and there's a Coulombic force that, that comes into play. And so the chemistry is a little bit different, but in the end, the energetics of that bond is about the same as what you get from a covalent bond. Again, one to 10 electron volts. And then metallic bonds are also like covalent bonds, but they have freely moving electrons that makes them have that metallic character of, of high electrical conductivity and in some cases high thermal conductivity. Again, those energies are about one to 10 electron volts. And th these energy levels are important for us because the stronger that bond, what we're going to find is the better the heat flows, whether it's by electrons or by phonons. So to conclude the lecture for today, uh, this is the schedule uh, that we're going to go through. This week we will continue with the, the study of lattice structure. Um, phonons, something that I think most people have heard of but many do not understand and appreciate fully, um, and electrons. So we're going to finish this week by, by really understanding and defining what phonons and electrons are and especially their thermal energy states. Um, next week will be carrier statistics. The third week will involve basic thermal properties. And then at the end, we'll go through um, 
uh, Landauer formalism in the fourth week, and then the fifth week we'll talk about transmission, which is really a combination of scattering and interfaces. And as you might expect, in, in nanostructures especially, interfaces become very important because there are so many more of them, at least per unit length, that the carriers have to travel. So um, anyway, I look forward to this journey with you, and uh, I'll see you next time.